Hi everyone and welcome back for another episode of the Wellbe show and podcast. Um, I am so excited to have with me Jill Blakeway today. She is a licensed and board certified acupuncturist and clinical herbalist. She is also the founder of the lovely Unova Center in New York City where we are right now. And she is the author of three books including Energy Healing which you can see there, which we'll be discussing a lot about today, but also about acupuncture and the rest of her life and career. Um, she also teaches gynecology and obstetrics at the doctoral, in the doctoral program at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in San Diego, and has a focus on fertility in her practice. She was also the first acupuncturist, which I love, to ever give a TED Talk at TED Global in 2012. A very exciting career and person. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's lovely to be on your show. Thank you. Okay, so first things first, clearly you are not Chinese or even Asian, so I would love to know how you got from Great Britain to Chinese medicine and becoming an acupuncturist and energy healer. Yes, it was a bit of a journey. And in fact, it's a journey I tell in this book, Energy Medicine, which is part memoir, which is how I got from being a sort of pretty sort of ordinary British girl um, and, and very conventional. I worked for the Queen. I, I, you know, I did not think I was going to end up an acupuncturist in New York, let alone an energy worker, um, and how I got here. And how I got here was in stages. I um, discovered acupuncture. And like a lot of acupuncturists of my generation, I've done this for 25 years, but I um, I, I, I came to it because I saw that it worked and then I became fascinated and I sort of fell down a rabbit hole of Chinese medicine and I ended up doing a master's and then a doctorate in Chinese medicine and acupuncture is energy medicine but for a long time I didn't necessarily understand how deeply connected to energy medicine it is. It is in fact one of the oldest forms of energy medicine but when I started to practice I started to feel the energetics of the treatment and that led me on a journey to explain the science as well as some of the mystery behind the energy medicine which is why the book's called Energy Medicine the Science and Mystery of Healing. You said you came to it because you saw that it worked but was it a personal health experience where you, you know, interacted with acupuncture and that's what you saw? The first time, yes. And I think that's true of a lot of people. They discover Chinese medicine when they have a chronic illness that nothing's helping. Chinese medicine is particularly good for long-term chronic illnesses. And I had a series of niggly health problems. They were not, you know, life-threatening. And someone in a health food store said, why don't you see an acupuncturist? And I, I was hooked. He helped me immediately. And I decided eventually to go to Chinese medical school and work out what it was all about. Besides acupuncture, you know, what is it and what therapies does it officially include? Well, energy healing refers to all those modalities that either diagnose or treat illness by manipulating the energy, the electromagnetic energy that pulses through every cell. And so it's a broad field. It includes acupuncture uh, at one end. It's not just an energetic technique. It is actually more physical as well. Um, and acupuncturists are the only licensed and board certified energy workers, which means they are held to a certain standard of education and a certain standard ethically and things like that. But there are some very interesting hands-on and hands-off therapies. And energy medicine covers things like Reiki and pranic healing and therapeutic touch as well. And in the book, I set off on a journey. I was very lucky. Harpy Collins paid me to go around the world and meet with healers and also scientists who could explain what they were doing and measure the effects. Uh, and so I, I met some extraordinary healers um, as, I, as I journeyed, particularly in Japan. I spent a bit of time in Japan. And there is a big tradition of energy medicine in Japan. It's where Reiki comes from. I was thinking of something else you mentioned in your book about, was it sound therapy or music therapy? Is is that included in energy? Yes, anything that's a wave that carries information on a frequency um, is part of energy medicine. And in the book, I tell the story of a young man called Madhu who fell out of a window when he was in college and unfortunately broke his neck and was um, told he would be a tetraplegic. His, his spinal cord was 99% severed. And he lay in hospital and he started to make tones and the vibration um, he could feel through his body. Now, if you think about being tetraplegic, it's actually quite hard to make noise because your diaphragm doesn't work properly. But he kept, kept making these tones and people taught him mantras and someone brought in a Tibetan prayer wheel and his dad would lift him up 
up and help him spin it. And he had the common sense to realize that if he could feel the vibration through his body, he had enough central nervous system to communicate a signal. And he healed himself uh, with this vibration, and uh, but not completely. The reason I love this story is that, of course, he needed doctors. He had extraordinary surgery. He was in UCSF, which is one of the best neurological departments in the country. So he had very good care. But there was no doubt that the vibration that he created down his spinal cord is what um, uh, made the difference. And Madhu walked out of hospital three months after his accident. And a nurse told him, I think very kindly, not out of malice, you need to stop hoping, Madhu. You need to, to start working out how to be the best tetraplegic you can be instead of thinking that you're going to walk. And he, he said to me, I'm paraphrasing, but he said to me, um, I, I wasn't stupid, Joe. I knew that I would probably end up in a wheelchair, but I never let it permeate my being which is such an interesting thing. He was only 23 at the time, and I think that shows great presence of mind. And of course he was right, and he did walk. Wow, I can't wait to hopefully meet this person one day well, when I'm in San Francisco. He works as a Francisco. sound healer now. Oh my gosh. Isn't that, I mean, it, that's so interesting. It changed the trajectory of his life, and he now works as a sound healer. Yeah, so many of us, I think, you know, who have gone through something either that life-threatening or yes. you know with our families and our own health that end up in this field it's very hard to find someone that just sort of nope nothing's happened to me i just <laughs> you know just came to do this on on a random whim you talked about how this book covered so much about the science behind energy healing which i appreciated because i'm a research and science junkie as well i know it has its limita limitations and science can be manipulated, but I love to see when scientific research is being done in fields that people, you know, haters, as I call them, would like to say, oh, that's not science. And I say, oh yeah? Well, why is Northwestern doing studies on it? Why is, you know, UCSF has a great um, integrative medicine program and research center. So that's really important, I think, to bring into the fold because I love proof and I think it helps. What is the scientific basis for acupuncture specifically? Well, it's complicated. It took me an entire chapter to look at it in the book. Um, the, the physiological effects of acupuncture are quite easy to prove. So for a long time, we've been able to show by MRI that it makes changes in the brain that affect the relationship with pain. We can use Doppler ultrasound to show that it increases blood circulation. We can use thermal imaging to show that it um, decreases inflammation. And there have been lots of theories as to why it works. Uh, and I felt when I looked at this book that they didn't really go deeply enough, um, but they were all true. So for a long time, um, people thought it was the gate theory, which it really means that um, a, a gate gets closed if you overstimulate a nerve and um, it interrupts the pain signal. Or you can show that acupuncture increases endorphins. And so people assumed that um, that increase in, in endorphins, was, which is your body's own natural opiates, was was, was pain relief. But for the book, I was really interested in the energetics of it. So I went looking for scientists who were studying this. And the first person I looked at was Dr. Helen Langevin at the University of Vermont Medical School, who looked at how acupuncture points themselves are different from other tissue, which is so interesting. And what she did is she looked at the pull force of a needle, which means when we put a needle in, we manipulate it a little bit, as you know, with mm -hmm. acupuncture. And then it, 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 the body Body grasps it and the pull force is 18% higher at the acupuncture points and when she did research which she did on um, rat abdomen in fact tissue um, she saw that the connective tissue winds around the needle like spaghetti around a fork and that makes it more electroconductive so that was my first clue that the acupuncture points are more electroconductive. And then I wondered, why? <laughs> why? And um, the answer lies in embryology. It turns out, and nobody ever asked this question, or at least I hadn't, is how do embryos communicate with themselves? I don't know whether you've ever asked that, but, um, yeah. you know, they need a communication system. And we communicate through our central nervous system or often through the blood, through the cardiovascular system, through hormones and proteins in the blood. But um, embryos don't have a sophisticated enough cardiovascular or central nervous system. And what they do is they do it electrically. 
and I'm going to refer you to a YouTube video, you and your viewers, um, called Electric Frog Face. It's from Tufts University and it's a frog embryo um, creating itself and it's like lightning going across. And the way that the body does it is to create little staging posts that then have an electrical reaction and then the next bit of the body comes, buds off from that. And if you put the major acupuncture points on a map of those staging posts, uh, they're in exactly the same place. So it turns out that what was used to create us in some ways is once we're here, used to regulate us, I think, or mildly, which is interesting. Yes, um, I think there's a lot of people who in my audience know this, but just so anybody who doesn't, the acupuncture points then connect to different organs and pieces of the body, right? So that's why you'd be putting the points in them to begin with. Well, that was another mystery to me. And in the book, I tell the story that I worked in a hospital in an OB department, and we were clearly able to use acupuncture points to dilate the cervix in women in labor. We could measure it. And in fact, the NIH gave us a grant to study it because it was so interesting. But I wondered how a point on the leg down here somewhere could dilate the cervix of a woman in labor. And I didn't think that had been adequately explained. Um, however, I think it goes back to the connective tissue we talked about when we talked about the, the nature of acupuncture points. One of the major forms of connective tissue in the body is fascia, and it's everywhere. It wraps our organs, it keeps our body in compartments. When I was writing the book, I talked to a surgeon who told me I was always taught never to cut the fascia if I could avoid it because bad things happen, adhesions and things like that. And fascia is extremely electroconductive. It has a very high collagen content, and collagen has a lot of water in it. As, as you can imagine, because that's why we put it on our face and, and things like that. Um, so the fascia is very electroconductive. And if you look again at a map of the fascial planes, you'll find that they line up with the major acupuncture meridians. So I think um, that is how that signal gets communicated deeply into the body. Oh, okay. So putting, you know, an acupuncture needle into, like you're talking about, you know, down here, uses the fascial planes to communicate to the cervix. To yes, dilate. the point itself is more electroconductive than the tissue around it, and then it contacts the fascia and sends a mild but profound in its impact signal through the body. This is a ridiculous question maybe, but how does it know where to go once you put it in. Maybe it would go up to, you know, your heart or something. <laughs> well, the acupuncture points have been used for thousands of years, and I think they probably work them out by trial and error to start with, if you see what I mean. But it's following the path of a specific fascial plane. Got it. So this one here does actually go all the way up to the groin. And I imagine they didn't have x-rays and things like that when they were working out where these points were. So I imagine they did it all what's called empirically which means trial and error. Oh, that's fascinating. I've been doing acupuncture for a long time, but never really thought about the how details and how it works. Yeah. So you talked about fascia and cells and connective tissue, um, but how does that all relate to the science of other kinds of energy medicine? I think that's a really good question. And also, how does that then relate to chi, if you could explain a little bit about that? Well, chi, every ancient culture has a concept of what the Chinese call qi, an energy that animates us. So, you know, the Greeks saw it as the pneuma, the breath. Um, in Judeo-Christian tradition, it's the breath of life. Um, in um, Ayurveda, which is from India, it's called prana. The Chinese call it qi. And what they were talking about, really, was the relationship between energy and matter that we're not just matter, we are matter, we are solid, we are, you know, we're not actually as solid as we think we are, we're all vibrating, but you know what I mean, we have skin and bone and flesh, but we also have something that animates us. And uh, in that way, back in the day, science and philosophy and medicine were all intertwined. And then in the West, we unintertwined them, <laughs> we separated them out, and medicine is over here, and spirituality is over here, and philosophy is over here. Um, but Qi, at its most basic, it's electromagnetic. I like to call it your body's intelligence. 
I like to think of it like that. It's your body's ability to restore homeostasis. There's something really smart about our bodies. If we have a couple too many drinks at dinner, our liver goes into overdrive overnight. <laughs> How does it know to do that? There is an innate intelligence. There's a messaging system within the body. Um, so that is chi. And then your question was really, how? what's the scientific basis for the other forms of energy medicine? And that took me a book to disentangle because they're a little harder to um, understand and they've been less studied than acupuncture. But you can measure the force, the frequency, coming out of a Qigong master's hands. That's a sort of um, Chinese version of Reiki in some ways. Um, and it's a thousand times greater than the energy that comes out of the largest energy field in the body, which is the heart. Uh, and at, it's a very low frequency, which is interesting. And when I was researching the book, I looked at that low frequency, and it turns out quite coincidentally, at the best orthopedic hospital in the world now, they run a, a very low frequency through bone to speed up healing. And it's the same frequency, which I think is interesting. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. And I um, wonder what happened in my body when I was treating patients. So I had an EEG of my brain and an EKG of my heart while I was working. And it turns out that my brain and my heart go into what's called resonance. They start to go at the same frequency. And to do that, I slow my brain down quite a lot. Uh, and then um, energy comes out of my hands that's measurable. It feels warm, but it's not actually warm. It's a bit like a microwave. If you measure the, the, the patient will tell you, oh, Jill's hand feels warm. I think my hand feels warm. But when you measure it, it's not, which is interesting. And then the patient's heart goes into resonance with mine. We all go at the same frequency. And I think when that happens, information gets transferred. And that's when the magic happens. That is so cool. You mentioned this also in your book, and I thought this was so interesting, the placebo effect, right? The placebo effect is wildly powerful. And I learned this filming uh, the interview of Kelly Noonan Gores, who interviewed a lot of doctors in, um, in her documentary, Heal, all about the mind-body connection. And there were so many modalities that she mentioned, and you know there was a lot of great research. But she also talked about the power of just the placebo and the mind to overcome things itself. And so I wondered how that kind of plays into energy medicine. Is it a component? How much of it accounts for that? I think it's a really good question. I devoted an entire chapter to placebos in my book. It's what I gave a TED talk about, in fact. Um, and the way I see it is that there is a continuum of things that act as prompts to the body to self-heal. And those prompts can be um, physical, like acupuncture, but they can also be suggestion. And you're absolutely right, the placebo effect works. Uh, that, and it doesn't just subjectively work, it can be objectively measured to work. And by that I mean um, there's a study that shows that Parkinson's patients whose brains lack dopamine, if you give them a placebo and tell them it's a medicine, they will make their own dopamine and you can measure it. So our minds are profoundly um, powerful. And um, so that is, it's hard then to tease out, both in Western medicine and other forms of medicine, how much of any cure is a placebo, I think because some, uh, there is some element in, in all medicine. And in the book, I talked to a, an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Ian Harris um, at Northwestern University in Sydney, Australia. And he wrote a book called Surgery, the Placebo. And he talks about how a lot of the common orthopedic surgeries don't work any better than placebo when they're measured against a sham. And they actually do sham surgeries these days, which blew my mind. <laughs> uh, and they, for instance, they do sham um, knee surgeries where they open people up uh, and then close them up again without having done the surgery and then they do an orthroscopic knee surgery um, uh, on some people and the control group who have the sham surgery do just as well as the people who had the orthroscopic knee surgery. It blew my mind that that was ethical because right. it's one thing to do energy medicine, which has no real side effects. It's quite another thing to do a surgery and open people up and give them anesthetic and things like that. But I guess it is the only way to tease it out. So my well, Right, still, I wouldn't want a scar to be part of an experiment, but I mean... I guess they gave their consent and they get better. Right. So um, it's, uh, yes, I guess that's it. But there is a range of prompts that you can give people to self-heal and they're all interesting. Um, and acupuncture isn't straight placebo in so much as, as I said, we can measure, measure the physiological effects of it quite easily. Um, but there will be some placebo 
in it, just like there is in those knee surgeries. I love the idea that these different things are just moving this stagnant energy so that you can clear a path for the immune system to come through and say, oh yeah, there is a problem over there, let's go fix it. Because something has happened in which they can't tell that or they can't react, they being the immune system, even though. Your body's a sort of self-healing machine in some ways and it right. does it every single day if you think about it. It deals with all sorts of things. Absolutely. What some, if... Sometimes it gets overwhelmed and sometimes it needs medicine, but sometimes it just needs a little prompt. I loved also hearing about, you know, referencing the immune system, how much success they've been having lately with immunotherapy drugs because for cancer and such, I mean, it, they're really just, you know, accessing the power of the immune system, even though it's in this field of Western medicine and pharmacology, but it, it all comes back to that. So I just love the idea that people are on, you know, both sides of medicine, this conventional Western healthcare system and, and everything else, all kind of trying very hard to use different physical and mental ways to access the power of our immune systems and allow us to self-heal. Because I really believe that that's the most powerful thing we have at the end of the day. Well, interestingly, in the book, I actually have a story uh, about a man who w worked out how to heal cancer in mice via the immune system. And it's through an energy technique, and it's fascinating. There is a man in New York, his name is Dr. William Bengston. He teaches at City University here in New York. And many, many years ago, back in the 70s, he learned an energy healing technique from a psychic healer and decided to take it into the lab. And what he did was he took um, mice that especially bred to have cancer, poor mice. And these are mice that reliably, when you give them cancer, die on day 27. And so it's how pharmaceuticals are tested. So if you have a pharmaceutical that keeps them alive to say day 32, then you've got something promising. Um, so they took these mice that had been specially bred to have cancer, they gave them mammary cancer, breast cancer, and uh, Bill did the technique. And they started to get worse to start with. They looked much worse, and then they got better over a period of weeks and uh, they recovered completely but interestingly to your point about the immune system when they re-injected them with the cancer they couldn't get it their immune systems had been permanently changed so Bill did what all good scientists do he I mean he's just a scientist he's uh, he's not a dogmatically in favor of energy medicine or anything good science should be replicable you know it, it, there's no point in having a special somebody somewhere that nobody else can see and then measuring them uh, in the sun limited value to that but but the real value of science is when it builds and we we all learn and we can reproduce it in various um, ways so Bill took a group of skeptical students and he told them I believe that they were doing research into gullibility which I'm sure they believed and they all got groups of mice to do and uh, there was also a control group and um, reliably he could teach these students the technique and they would reverse the cancer in the mice. And he very generously let me put the technique in the book. So when you read the book, you you, you can learn it. It's quite simple, although it's, uh, it takes a little while to practice and, uh, and learn it, but it's not complicated. It just requires practice. Um, and they have done this, um, repeated these studies at City University with thousands and thousands of mice. And they are clearly able to uh, provoke the mouse his immune system into both reversing the cancer and not being able to get it back. Why isn't that so, you know, making its way into... Well, he had trouble getting that study published. It was in the end published, but a lot of major journals turned it down. And um, Bill actually had eight Nobel Prize winners endorse the science behind it because the science is impeccable. And Bill's not positioned about it. He says, look, if you can think of a better experiment, <laughs> then tell me. Um, because this is an anomalous result, but it's significant uh, because it's replicable uh, over and over again. And it was just really hard to get people to publish it because confirmation bias is a bit of a drug. We see it in our politics at the moment. People de-emphasize the news that doesn't agree with their worldview and emphasize the news that does. And that's why we have so much polarization in our politics, yeah? Um, and it's the same in science, that we've been taught a certain thing. This flies in the face of it, you know, that mice can heal themselves of cancer given a prompt. 
And um, so we de-emphasize it if we're not careful. But his science is good. And I devoted an entire chapter to his story. It gets more complicated because it turned out that this was information on a wave that could be put into things. So they at Brown University, he put the information into cell medium and they put human cancer tissue into the cell medium. And when I wrote the book, it had made nine genetic changes in the human cancerous tissue. And by the time the book came out, Bill came to my book launch, he told me it had made 67 um, genetic changes to the human cancerous tissue. And that is an extraordinary thing. So he's off there studying this. And I felt like people should know, which is why I wrote about him. Yeah, I think people should know, I which is why so. I'm glad you're talking about <laughs> it right now. What kind of conditions would you say you've had the most success treating or managing through your energy healing, both just acupuncture and then also the other you know, hands-on energy healing that you do. At the Unova Center, we treat everyone. We're known for our fertility specialty because my first book was called Making Babies, but we actually treat whole families. We treat tiny babies with colic and we treat senior citizens with arthritis and everybody in between. Uh, and we find acupuncture really helpful, as I said before, for the chronic diseases, you know, the, the things that are a tangle of different systems uh, interrelating or not relating very well. Um, so so I um, have treated just about all sorts of chronic diseases with, with good success. Fertility has been a particular fo focus of mine. I think not being able to conceive is hugely painful. And um, often Chinese medicine is particularly good at teasing out the complex amalgam of issues that create um, infertility. It's often not one thing. It's lots of little things that start to gang up on people. And we're particularly good at, at sorting that out. I think because um, it's subtle. And, and its its subtleness is in fact its strength. And that's true of all energy medicine. If you think about hormones, they're in a feedback loop with other hormones. So if you give pharmaceutical hormones, even in small doses, you tend to throw off a lot of other hormones too. And you cause, if you're not careful, as many problems as you solve. Well, Chinese medicine and energy medicine broadly is more um, normalizing. It's prompting your body to restore homeostasis. It's prompting your body's intelligence to kick in. And I think that means when it comes to something as subtle as hormones, I, I think that means that it works particularly well because it's so balancing and it's not, you know, affecting other hormones while it's doing it. That's a great description. I've known that acupuncture was very effective for fertility more than other things, but I wasn't really sure why. And I would say having had a hormone related issue myself when I was in college, I think I mentioned I had amenorrhea for two years. You're absolutely right in that there's definitely not one, it's a combination of yeah. issues that finally come to a head and your body can't quite handle it and so it stops you know, producing yes. monthly menstruation. But I kept looking for that one silver bullet and then once I finally healed, actually through um, you know, Chinese herbs and supplements and some diet change and a little acupuncture, um, I realized that it was a couple of things that had happened in my life that were related and I wasn't realizing that all of those things come together and create a big impact because they all seemed kind of, you know, small. Studying abroad in China with some, you know, parasites and a poor diet at college and these little, you know, a, a low thyroid and all together created they this. they gang up on they you. They gang up on you. And it's also true that Chinese medicine recognizes mental and emotional and spiritual pain um, as completely equal and entangled with physical issues, uh, whereas Western medicine tends to separate them out. Uh, and again, there's often an emotional element as well as a physical element, um, you know, and, and a lifestyle element to a lot of hormonal uh, disorders and um, there's a sort of stigma about the emotional element in Western medicine that there isn't in Chinese medicine and I think that's helpful too. Yes, absolutely. Somebody I heard describe conventional or Western healthcare as you know a, a two-party system. You've got mental health care facilities over here paying no attention to diet or any other lifestyle things that might be going on and then you've got the physical which doesn't pay any attention to the mental really um, and until they come together, it's very hard to heal either one. I agree. And it's what I was saying before about the relationship with, between energy and matter. Um, we've separated them out 
in our Western societies, but we're energetic spiritual beings with feelings. Right. And we need to acknowledge that we're not just machines that break down and have to be kind of repaired. We're people in all our roundedness, in all our magnificence, really. And I talk to people all day and I just, I think human beings are awesome. But we're sort of fascinating amalgams of, you know, emotion and experience and physicality. And until we take all of that into account, we're not really taking care of whole people. Right. Since you focus so much on fertility in your practice, how do you think hormones, and you sort of just described this, but how do they fit into the energy fields that you described before? It was sort of what I was saying is that uh, it's very normalizing. And so bringing them back into balance um, is subtle. I think, and I think that's the answer to that question. And when it comes to acupuncture uh, and fertility, we do know that acupuncture increases circulation to the ovaries, and so it potentiates a healthy egg in the follicle. We know that it increases circulation to the uterus, so that we know that it helps the uterine environment for implantation. So we know that it balances hormones. We particularly know that it offsets the effect of the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response, on the uterine environment, but also on, on hormones. So it's, it, again, it's multifaceted. It's part physical uh, and it's part prompting your body and your body's intelligence, your chi, as I would call it, to restore order. Uh, and when you were treating your amenorrhea, what you eventually came to was you did things that restored order. You realized, oh, my diet in college, my parasites are meaning I'm not absorbing nutrition and my body thinks I'm in, you know, famine and has quite smartly cut down, <laughs> you know, and is saying, we won't have babies until the famine is over. What you need was better nourishment. And so it's about restoring order in some ways and rhythm. Yes, and the herbs, I think, made a huge difference. Yes, they um, really do. I they know you're really also do. an herbalist. Could you talk a little bit about how that plays into restoring order and um, your healing practices. Yes. We're sitting right next to our herbal pharmacy, in fact, here at Unova. And at Unova, we believe that everybody needs their own tailored uh, herbal preparation, that you can't really pull things off the shelf, that we are this weird amalgam of our history and our physiology and our spirit and our, and our feelings. And, and so we create a specific herbal formula for every patient and then we tweak it. We tweak it through the month for our female patients as they go through their cycle. So they'll have a different formula when they're building a follicle than they will when they need higher progesterone after they've ovulated. But we also um, uh, modify the formula as they improve or don't for that matter. <laughs> you know, as their internal landscape changes, we're reacting. And so herbology at its best, Chinese herbology, is like a communication with the body. It's not that you take a supplement, you take the same supplement for a year. It's that you're on a journey and the herbs should be taking you on that journey. And so as you change, the herbs should change with you. And that's the kind of herbology we practice at the Unova Center. In Chinese medicine, we create formulas that um, uh, can be absorbed. So we take into account people's um, GI system. Some people have an enormous problem getting nutrition from their food. And we would add herbs to help them digest the herbs we're giving them to make sure that they reach the organs they're supposed to reach. And then we have a very well worked out system of herbology. Each herb um, affects different organs and different organ systems. And um, you know, some of them are cardiovascular tonics, some of them cleanse the liver, some of them um, help support the kidneys, some of them make you pee, right. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and it's the fun of our job is putting together a herbal formula for, for each patient, but it's also the responsibility of our job. And we have five years of tertiary education. We have doctorates in what we do. It's not a pull a herb from the um, shelf in Whole Foods kind of thing. This this is um, herbology, very targeted. The acupuncturists at the Unova Center are board certified herbalists and they're very skillful. Well, you are very much convincing me that I need to come <laughs> get one of your custom herbal formulas. <laughs> Moving into talking through sort of all of this at the system level, because there's clearly research. This has been thousands of years. There's pretty much no side effects to energy medicine or you know, acupuncture specifically. In your book, I read that the NIH is recommending that acupuncture be taught in conventional Western medical schools. Is that really happening? Is that, you know, what's the adoption rate? And do you see that 
coming to fruition? I do, actually. Um, I, as I said, I, I ran a program in a hospital. I find doctors very open to acupuncture particularly. What they worry about, and they're right to, is charlatans. You know, they worry about people over-promising and under-delivering. They worry about people being led astray and not getting the treatment they need. They worry about unsafe practices. And to be honest, as a licensed practitioner, I worry about those things too. I have to say, I, I have a section on charlatans in my book. I didn't meet that many, uh, but I did meet some exploitative people. Uh, and some deceptive people, and I talked about it um, in, in the book. But I find that doctors are very open to looking at this, and more and more open. I work with doctors all the time, and uh, it's all about how you communicate with them. Obviously, if you just um, uh, talk very esoterically, <laughs> it's, it's a little harder to communicate. But I have worked in hospitals, I speak doctor, and I understand what I'm doing um, physiologically, and I am perfectly capable of explaining it, and I have good relationships with doctors. We all do at the Unova Center. We actually pride ourselves on being able to integrate our treatment with people's Western medical treatment. Yeah, it seems like this is the kind of place that really um, values that. And I'm, I'm sure doctors are happy to work with you because you're so interested in science and, and so knowledgeable in both what you do and what they do. Um, so if I'm, you know, somebody watching this and I have some little chronic health issues, but I'm not really, I've never tried acupuncture, I've never tried energy healing. Where do you start? Are there things that you can do on your own as far as energy healing? I know you had a few sort of self-healing things in the book that you mentioned. Um, what would you say, you know, if you have these couple of things, like this is a great fit for acupuncture, energy medicine, but perhaps if you have, you know, that, not so much, or where would you start if you were somebody who was just dipping their toe in? Well, I would say if you have something acute and life-threatening, do not call an acupuncturist. If you're having a heart attack, please, please call 911. And I will say one caveat to that, which is I had a horrible pinched nerve under my shoulder blade that I could not fix. And my acupuncturist just did a number on it. It was an extremely painful treatment, but it helped so much. So... Oh. We're very good at nerve pain, actually. Yeah. But, but in general, um, chronic issues, pain, um, imbalances, all the issues where one system is affecting another system, I think are a really good candidate for Chinese medicine. Um, multifaceted um, issues, uh, autoimmune problems, migraines, hormone disturbances, pain, headaches, digestive problems. Those are all good things to go to an acupuncturist for. And the thing about acupuncturists in this country is they are all licensed, which means that they are um, held to a standard ethically and also held to a standard educationally. They pass board exams and things like that. And I think that is helpful. Now, having said that, there are a ton out there of really talented energy workers who are not necessarily in the licensed end of the business because there is no licensure for that kind of thing. And some of them are amazing. Um, and in the book, I um, uh, try to help people find the best of those. And one of the things that I did was I talked to the head of psychiatry and law at Harvard, who is a forensic psychiatrist whose specialty is transgressions of the therapeutic relationship. And he told me that you should be careful to uh, avoid people who are a bit of a cult of one or have a lot of ritual and dogma or who tell you that only they could help you. We couldn't think of any case where that would really be the case. And he said to me, the only thing a, a good practitioner should be getting from treating you is their fee and the satisfaction of having done a good job. So if anyone's trying to get any more than that from you, introductions to people, um, I, I, sex is a big one, uh, unfortunately, then um, you need to give them a wide berth. Uh, so, um, but if, if people want to start out, and at the risk of plugging my book, <laughs> Energy Medicine, I do give you self-healing techniques in this book, and I do teach you how to transmit energy yourself. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure that people know is that you don't have to be a special person to do this, some special guru healer. I'm certainly not special, and I can do it. Um, you, everybody can. 
This is not something that relies on some special talent that only some people are born with. Everybody can do this and, and everybody can be taught to do this. And if you think back to Bill and the mice and the skeptical students, he could teach any of the students to do the technique that healed the mice. It wasn't that they needed to have a special aptitude. So it's just about if you were doing it on yourself, really understanding how to harness these waves and this energy in your own hands, I think, right? And Well, I give exercises at the end of every chapter in this book, as you know, and it's meant to lead you into your first steps at harnessing this energy and using it um, for, for healing. I love that. So now I want to ask you two questions that I think help, you know, a lot of people care, especially in the Wellbeing community, about trust and recommendations and knowing that certain people helped you and, and um, you had a good experience. So are there any, you know, any kinds of practitioners or doctors, um, since functional integrative medicine is a focus for us, that have helped you, that you, you know, recommend and loved working with, and would you be able to share, you know, any of those experiences, wherever they are? I think you should have somewhere in your medical armory, someone who takes a look at, at you as a whole person. Um, Chinese Practitioners of Chinese medicine do that, but also the functional medicine doctors and the naturopaths. And what they're doing is they're looking how one system interacts with another. So how the digestive system impacts the reproductive system, how the cardiovascular system and your circulation impacts, say, the reproductive system or the digestive system, how the digestive system and the gut microbiome affect mood for instance. So I think um, the people I have found helpful have been the people who take that look, and that's the naturopaths, the functional medicine doctors, and the Chinese medicine doctors. Got it. My last question for you is um, what we call our how I get well be question. So, you know, there's a lot of noise right now about um, wellness routines and morning rituals. And, you know, I think some of us believe it's starting to get stressful how many things we need to do before we can even leave the house for ourselves, <laughs> right? So I'm sort of in this, and I know some people have mentioned it to me as well, like how do you just pull some of these things back and ask people who live and breathe this um, what they do, what they're can't miss, you know, absolutely no matter what's going on in their day in their life, things that they do to ensure that they prevent, you know, chronic health issues and keep any that they've had at bay. So we say, you know, how I get well be is... Well, how would. I get well be <laughs> is I deal with a lot of people all day. I deal with patients. I have a big team here at Unova. And one of the things that I realized when I was writing this book is that the human energy field is real and it's interacting with people and it can be exhausting. And so I have learned to sort of seal myself off a little bit. At the beginning of every day, I send a in my imagination, a big old grounding cord down into the earth. And I used to think that visualizations were a bit hokey, but the truth is you can manipulate your energy field with your mind. And so visualization does work. So I send a big old, to me it's an anchor chain, all the way down into the earth. And I wait till it makes me feel kind of heavy. I'm doing it now and I can feel it. I just feel solid and heavy. And actually sometimes you can feel your voice getting deeper, like you're just here. And then I open up the top of my head in my mind and I bring in light, my own light, my own spiritual light, my connection to you, to everything, to spirit, to, to the world we live in. And I fill myself with my own light in my mind. And then I push it just an inch outside my body everywhere, like a little protective egg of light. And I try and go through my day like that. I sometimes have to top it up at about 11 o'clock and again at four or something <laughs> and again before I go to bed. But since I have been doing that, I have been less swept up in other people's dramas. I've been less stressed um, and uh, less anxious. And I think, you know, in a busy city like New York, particularly where we're just surrounded by people and their own energy fields, giving yourself a little egg of light <laughs> that acts as protection between you and everybody else is not a bad idea. I love that. And I'm sure it's, you know, that little bit that's outside of you is also running into other people's energy fields and bringing them some light when they, you know, haven't brought it to themselves. Well, that's a nice thought. I hope that's true. <laughs> that was the thought I had. When you're on the subway and you bump into somebody, you're just, you're <laughs> giving them the light. light. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been so interesting and wonderful. I love to hear how you're bringing, you know, the Western healthcare system and 
modern day issues and these ancient traditions, thousands of years of you know, trial and error to get to where we are today and how many things that you're talking about have also affected me and improved things in my health. So thank you so much again thank for having you. me here. You have a beautiful space too, by the way. Hope thank everybody you. comes to visit um, the Neonova Center either in Flatiron or um, Brooklyn Heights in New York City and picks up a copy of Jill's wonderful book.